autographs, you know, autographs galore, uh, and people excited to get backstage and meet people. And uh, you know, there were about, we had a very lackluster dress dressing room that was kind of off color green with uh, you know broken chairs and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And I remember my first time in the dressing room. I was talking to one of the musicians. He was looking at me and he said, uh, he said, ah, first time here, huh? I go, yeah. He said, uh, so he, he was a veteran musician. He said, so this is show business. I go, oh yeah. He says, exciting, isn't it? <laughs> We're just sitting in a chair, you know, sitting in a chair in this empty room waiting to go on stage. So this, this whole persona of, you know, the excitement of it, you know, people don't really see what's what you know what's behind the stage. You know, what's well, people, well, the, the, the performers would come on wearing tuxes in, in those days, wouldn't they? They did big time, big yeah. time tuxes, formal shirts, cufflinks. Did you have to wear the same thing? We wore tuxes all the time. Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah. And we never, never did not wear a tuxedo. It was a very formal place, and people were dressed to the max. Nobody would show up there in jeans. I mean, women. You know, women came in gowns and. Men either came in, men would come in suits, but men either came in tuxes or suits. I mean, talk to the audience, you know, and uh, even if there were kids there, because there, there were, because families were encouraged, then the kids were dressed well. I mean, nobody was there in torn dungarees and T-shirts. Everybody was dressed very well, kind of like old-time Hollywood. In fact, it had a lot of feeling of old-time Hollywood, and they were basically trying to reproduce the feelings that had been associated with the heyday of Las Vegas with all the famous performers and the neon lights flashing. And the only difference was that although the Latin casino was called a casino, it did not have gambling. Yeah, I yeah. thought that was strange. Do you yeah, know why that is? The why they called yeah, it the casino? And, and, and I think that they called it casino because they were emulating the performing uh, vibe of Las Vegas of which everything was in a casino. I mean, all the theaters are in casinos in Vegas. So I think that's probably why they called it a uh, casino. I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't have a few card games going on up there. <laughs> we never saw them, but I would be surprised. But they did not have slot machines, so in that sense they weren't a casino the way we think of casinos. Well, it must have been the, the center of Cherry Hill nightlife. Oh, to and, say the least. And it South was. Philly, too? Did people come from South Philly to, to the club? Probably. Yeah. Totally, yeah, and and really from the whole tri-state area, New Jersey, uh, Delaware, um, you know, and Philly. Yeah, they they came from all over for that. They would come by bus loads. A lot of times there would be a you know a bus trip, and somebody had organized a trip, you know, from Baltimore to the Latin Casino, and they would come. Also remember the Latin Casino was directly across the street from the uh, cherry from the uh, from the racetrack. Garden State Racetrack. That's right. Garden State Racetrack was right across the street. <laughs> So people would come in the afternoon, go to the races, then they would come over, have dinner, see a show. You know, it was it was quite, it was quite, uh, it was quite a period. I really feel like I missed out. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, but but we could all say that about whatever it was that we missed out. You know, That's we also true. missed Louis Armstrong. You know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, but it was it was a very uh, it was a very exciting uh, time, and it was it was unusual to be to be hanging, you know, with all these people. I remember when Merv, I was standing backstage one time and Merv Griffin was there and we were doing some benefit or something. So it was like a marathon, you know, kind of a I don't know, telethon marathon kind of a thing. And I was sitting, I was standing backstage and Merv Griffin was next to me and Suzanne Summers was over there and, uh, you know, Steve Landisbury was on the other side. And, uh, We'd been there for a long time and everybody was hungry. And there was this one like stale donut left. And Merv turns to me and goes, you can eat that? <laughs> I go, no, Merv, you can have it. <laughs> he says, thanks. <laughs> so here's this billionaire. Yeah, billionaire. You know, next to me, you know, kind of looking at me, thinking, thinking I was going to wrestle him for the donut. <laughs> so it was pretty comical. Well, I guess you'd moved on by 78 when the club closed, but I guess it closed because Atlantic City uh, legalized gambling, and so... That's exactly, that's exactly what happened. It was just that, that competition. And, and Las Vegas and uh, Atlantic City, I believe, if I'm not wrong, created some condition 
in the contracts for the performers mm -hmm. that they couldn't perform within a certain radius of Atlantic City. Yeah, I believe it was a 60 mile radius. Something yeah, like that. And, that, and so that, that even stopped the major entertainment from even signing deals. Uh, with with the Latin, you know what I mean. So once they did have their entertainment, they weren't that good of a restaurant. Yeah, <laughs> like they weren't very good restaurant at all. So really? Thing, <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> the whole thing, the whole thing, was the entertainers. It was like you know, come see, you know, come see Sammy Davis Jr. and and then of course they had the best entertainers in the world. There was there was no argument about the level of talent. You know, they weren't bringing in you know newcomers. Everybody yeah. in there was a headliner, you know, and uh, you could see, you, you could see, like from that partial list I read to you, you could see that, that the headliners, you know, of the world, the headliners of Las Vegas would be the same people that would be headliners at the Latin. So they weren't just, they weren't getting started with new singers. You, you had to be at the top of your game to be at the Latin. Yeah, if I had just seen... 20% of the names you named off in concert just once in my life, I would just, I would be over the moon. But to be able to, to you know, <laughs> to, to immerse yourself in it like that must have just been the greatest experience. It was, it was very, it was very fascinating, and it was fascinating on a lot of levels. The variety of music, of course, was very interesting. Uh, but also the performing styles. And because I, I do a lot of uh, music industry consultation today, I use a lot of what I observed to help people get ready for shows and things like that. You know, because I would hear, I would hear them talking to their managers, you know, about this and that, and talking to the light people and talking to the sound people and talking about programming and say, no, we can't do that tune before this tune because, you know, and they would really have their, they would really have their reasons. And some people uh, were very heavily involved in the rehearsal and some people never even showed up. Like Perry Como never even came to rehearsals. It, the whole thing was handled by his, uh, by his conductor, Nick Perito, who was his uh, longtime piano player. So some of them didn't even, like I said, didn't even show up, and others just loved rehearsal, and they just loved to sing, or you know, or they were dancers, or whatever they were. And some people loved that process.